very much. <clears throat> I'm just thankful that I can come up here. I'm, I'm provided this opportunity to come up here and share and what God has done, take part in this in some way. You know, years ago, you used to have the town crier. He would go down the city streets and around, and he'd ring a bell, hear ye, hear ye, gather around, hear the news. He, and, and when it had some kind of good news to proclaim, you know, we feel like that's what we're doing today. We're the, like the town crier, and we're, we're calling folks to uh, gather around. And uh, we, got, we got news. Hear all about it. We got news from heaven, brethren. We've got good news. And, uh, and so we, and we're eager to proclaim this when we can. And so uh, this good news is a little bit unique, you see, because it continues to be good news. I mean, once you town crier, like they had this man go on down the streets in London, he was actually dressed like the old town crier when the, uh, when the uh, baby was born in England. And uh, once they heard about the baby was born, it was old news, you see. That was old news. But what we proclaim, brethren, is good news. It it's, uh, it's, uh, continues to be uh, fresh and new. Amen. So we're, we're, uh, we're proud. We're, we boast in the fact that we can bring you something that's fresh, something that's relevant, and it's, it always comes in uh, like it should. So it doesn't fail us, you see, when we proclaim it. Now, you know, sir, there's a certain perspective that the brethren should have, a certain outlook about things, and we should never let it leave our sight. Like, for example, we are pilgrims, sojourning in the land as we are. In the earth right now, I mean, we're, we're pilgrims and sojourning. And, uh, and so we, we, we consider this and we view ourselves, as, and this, this is the way we should think about uh, our circumstances in the kingdom of God, that we're sojourners and pilgrims. Paul said it was momentary. It was our, our light afflictions are momentary. He was looking from a sojourning and a, and a, a, a wayfaring point of view. You know, uh, even way back in the days, early days, Jacob, Father Jacob. Now, he, he, he had a temporary point of view about things because he understood uh, I, I, it's just my pilgrimage. Living on this earth, that's my pilgrimage. You remember how he answered the Pharaoh when he asked him, How old art thou? And he said, uh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are. So that's, that's the way he viewed life as a pilgrimage. I praise God for the perspective of faithful men back then. They could pick up on the fact that we're just traveling through the land. But we've learned in these days of greater light that we, the focus of the light has come in greater. Not only, not only are we strangers in the land and pilgrims and, and passing through, but we've learned that our dispositions for the land has been changed. Why, God has made us where we don't even want to be here anymore, that, we, that we're, uh, we're eager to escape from here, and that we're not only passing through, but we're doing it with an expectation of a greater land. With great expectation, we walk the land with an understanding of the world to come. You see, Christ has brought us that. Now, so everything we do, I've talked about this outlook. Which, so everything we do and the way we think and, and the way we present ourselves to the world and each other, our preaching and our teaching should be about this, that we're on our way to glory. And uh, it should be about uh, uh, getting to glory and uh, working to make sure everyone who has set out for glory that we know of, make sure they make it. And uh, in this way, we're working together with God. So that's what we, this is the place we're going to be preaching from. After all, it is the core of the message of the truth. And this is what we're going to be preaching from this morning. Now, my text comes from a most extraordinary passage. Now, you, I know you know this. The apostle, uh, I'm not, and I'm not going to pass up an opportunity to make some comments, so I can't let this pass. The apostle, he just barely makes an introduction and a greeting to the brethren when he jumps right off into some very high and lofty considerations right there in the third verse. Praising God for his redemptive work and salvation. Now, you know Paul, he's got to be, Paul is speaking from heavenly places right here as he declares the realities of spiritual life by way of Christ Jesus. Now, to be in Christ Jesus in heavenly places, this is the theme of uh, Paul's exposition here. These 12 verses some, are some, no doubt, some of the most powerful statements and we have in all of Scripture. And they're powerful because they're all about God. They're all about, uh, the, test, uh, the, about the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit talks about all of them right here. They're mentioned here together. And it's a testimony of the unity by which they have brought salvation to man. This text concerns the purpose of God, and most directly the purpose of God 
to us and our and salvation to men. So I, you know, I actually I don't think uh, there's another text that states the, quite, the case quite so clearly of what it has does here, what God has accomplished, and why He's done it, and uh, through whom He's 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 accomplished it, and by which the means by which God guarantees it, ensures it. It's all right here in a nutshell. We had the purpose of God delineated in Christ Jesus, and we have it sealed up and secured by the Holy Spirit. Now, you, when you read texts like these, when the saints ponder scriptures like this, where it has a very strengthening effect. And these affirmations, when Paul expressed them, when we express them, because of the nature of the truth is this way, it confirms and further establishes the saints. Now, when the truth of what Paul is saying here kind of dawns on you like the day star rising, you just want to repeat after Paul in verse 3, Blessed be the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, well, my text is just, it's really uh, including this whole passage. It's a very sweet uh, passage of Scripture. Uh, the affirmations are very, very dear to us, very sweet to us. But, you know, as I, I begin to study this text, I realize this text will have a it'll have a very sweetness to it, and it's also will have a bitter af aftertaste to it. it. It's been brought up before. It's like the little book that John was told to eat in Revelation 10. It was sweet as honey uh, in the mouth, but then it was bitter in the stomach. This text has the same effect. It's a sweet recollection of God's calling and choosing of His people, how He's done it. Our acceptance in the beloved, that phrase is found here. And uh, we have redemption. We have redemption through his blood. That's there. Uh, it's, a, it's a sweet and gracious affirmation of, uh, of God, of forgiveness of sins. And God has lavished out his grace, the riches of his grace in Christ Jesus on us. Both wonderful and gracious, they're sweet things to consider. But the bitterness comes, is realized. And I know, brethren, you have this burden as well. It kind of turns into a burden. Uh, it, it, the harsh reality that we have these things here and when we stop to consider it that, uh, that this message of which Paul speaks of the world should know it the world should know this but they don't they don't know I mean experientially no they don't know it they should but they don't and more appalling this message is written to the brethren from Paul but the people of God should know this message like the back of their hand they should be living in an awareness of this. This should be, should be something that's, that's a, a source of motivation for them and a, and a hold out a hope of glory for them. Uh, it's a great disturbing thing, brethren. They should know it, but they don't. Both the world and the church should know these things by now and have an understanding of what Paul speaks. But as well as, as, well as I know, uh, you know, they do not. The world is plunging deeper and farther away from God. It knows little or nothing of the truth of his salvation. And then the professed church, and brother, look at it. Uh, what a mess. And then when you consider how it's happened, it's not so sweet a thing, is it? It's, it's quite bitter. Then you talk, you, you think of what the preacher should be preaching and what they're preaching. Uh, the teachers of God, what, they, what they're teaching and what they should be teaching, should always have to do with what it takes to walk with Christ in the kingdom of God. It's a message that our Lord brought. That's what he talked about when he was here. It's the same word we've been given, brethren, that the Lord brought. When the Lord was on this earth teaching, he had a word for his own disciples, the 12 that followed him everywhere he went. He had a word for them. He had a word for the religious leaders and teachers of his day. He had one for the great multitudes that followed him. Matter of fact, Jesus had a multitude. Jesus had a, a, a word for each, each, each of the segments of people he, he spoke. To. His message always fit who he was talking to. He spoke about the necessary things Jesus did. That's what he, he, the basic and the fundamental message, it uncomplicated and straightforward, plain. You could understand it. And if he wanted it to be, it could be plain. The Lord spoke concerning the needful things. He spoke the word of truth, and his word endures to this day, brethren. Amen. It concerns what men, what uh, God receives from men, who and what is acceptable in the kingdom of God. These are the, these, these are the things uh, uh, that the word uh, Jesus brought centered around. Now, you know, when I'm up here behind the pulpit myself, personally, I want to make sure that what I'm talking about is what Jesus talked about. 
Because if I'm doing that, then I know I'm talking about the necessary things, the needful things. What I have to say, it, it, I, yeah, I want it to be what the Lord taught. I mean, I'm trying to, yeah, I'll be honest with you, I'm trying to get away from all the commentary of men. Really, I am. What the people think uh, and the apostles meant. I, you know, when we're up here behind the pulpit, just tell me what they said, okay? And, 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 and then I'll make up my own mind what they meant. Is, is, there, is there a place for clarification and exposition? Yes, certainly there is. But we got to be careful. we got to be careful. There's a lot of dividing of the word going on in these days out there. And, and a, a great majority, I found, that is flawed and corrupt. They say it's from God. It's got Jesus all through it, but it's not about him, brethren. we got to make sure, each person's got to do this, we got to make sure that those we've chosen to listen to those we received as leaders, we got to make sure they, they rightly divide. Because there's such a thing as rightly dividing the Word of God. Now, those who aspire to be disciples of the Lord, they need to be reminded of the following words. These are some of the things that our, our Lord's message centered on. Core message. And there went with him a multitude. He's talking about the necessary things. And he turned to the multitudes and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and, children and brother and sister, yea, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And in the same breath he said, Whoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. No man having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the way of the kingdom, our Lord said. These are the kind of words our Lord was quick to make known. Right off the bat, he saw the crowd fall. Let me tell them this. To those who would think to follow after him in the kingdom of God, they got to know this. The Lord would go on to say, For I have come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against his mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household while he yet talked. To the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. But he answered and said unto him, uh, said it, that told him, who is my brother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother, sister, and mother. That's, Jesus made it pretty clear and, and cut, clear cut. Uh, the expectation of the kingdom is right there, what, God, what uh, God expects it to be. The essentials, these are essentials. Basic, straightforward. It's the message the Lord was given to proclaim. It was the truth of God. That's what we're talking about, the gospel message, which, as you very well know, is a word. It's a word that sharply opposes the word that comes from this world. It rubs the world the wrong way. Well, it's always done this, brother, because it's got a different nature. It's not surprising, is it, since this world is a domain of Satan and his whole world lies in wickedness and darkness. The people of God, they've uh, who carried the truth of who carried the truth of God, they've had an uncompromising message to bring to it, the world. Amen. Because the world is hostile to God, that's why. And the people who are attached to the world, they're hostile to it also. The messengers of God have always had a tough message to deliver. It's always been a tough message because the world didn't want to hear it. This has been the testimony all through the ages. The world has, the world has thrust this knowledge of God from them. And those who have brought it, they've shoved them away also, those who carried it. But the record always shows the testimony has been, regardless of the situation, Men who have brought it, men who have been uh, called to bring it, they have not withdrawn from declaring the truth. They have not shunned to declare the whole gospel of God. The prophets, you know, they're, they're come to quickly to mind, the most prominent examples. The people of God persecuted and killed their own prophets because they hated the message they brought to them. It was always a message that God brought. It was always a message they rejected. I, I'm reminded of the word that came to Jeremiah saying, I have sanctified thee and made thee a prophet. Before I formed thee and made thee to come out of the womb, I have sanctified and made thee a prophet. 
You remember what, you, what Jeremiah speak? Oh, Lord God, I cannot speak, but I, I'm, I, I'm just a child. I'm but a child. God, do not say I'm a child. You will go to whoever I send thee, and you will declare whatever I command thee. No matter what the circumstances, we can't afford to compromise and back away from the truth of the gospel, this glorious salvation. We've got to make sure we preach. It's what we preach is consistent with what the Lord brought. Now, you know, we have a love for the truth here in our assembly. We can thank God for this. I mean, you might want to just thank God right now that we've got, we've got a record here. You know, because I tell you, brethren, if it had been left up to men, we wouldn't have this. We wouldn't have the testimony. That's right. We'd have be, be the doctrines of men. That's what we'd have if it was left up to men by now. But see, God, he made sure that we, we had this recorded. And, and we, so we have a testimony here written down for us. There's a four-sun scene and wicked operating in this world to delude men's minds. Keep them in the dark and unbelief about what God has said, the truth of what he said, that the core message. They, he's done this very effectively by having men change it around, adding and taking away from it. Satan has employed men to do this, adapt the message to the world, and make it strictly a, a, a word for this earthly uh, realm. Paul told the, Ephesians, uh, told the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, I know after my departing, Grievous wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the flock. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Men from your own number will come in and distort the truth. Now, you know, this has happened, of course you know this, in our time. So it's today. It's a, it's a day for us. It's, it's a day that uh, we can do something. We can, we can call... We can call forth. We can call forth for some straightforward talking like our Lord done concerning what God has done. And, and even though I said talk just then, I really don't mean talk. I, 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 well, we, can, we really don't want to talk about it. We, when we're up here, we really want to preach about it. We don't want to talk. I mean, when we're up here dressed in the saints, I mean to say that uh, we want to preach these things. We talk when we're around each other out there, but when we're behind the pulpit, we need to preach them. Bringing the things of God to bear on, our, on one another. We don't, want to be, we don't want to be just talking about it. We want to be preaching what God has accomplished in Christ Jesus. They have to be declared. And God has is, God is chosen man to do this. He's, he's, he's enrolled man to get up and declare these things to one another. The word of truth, it has to be made clear. It has to be done, it has to be done uh, over and over. It has to be done on a regular basis, made clear uh, to us it, that, it, that this message, it comes from God. It's God's message. Now, we can do this, brethren. This can be done. Men can do this. I'm thankful that we've been delivered from a place that wouldn't allow this to be done. We, we can preach and teach the gospel of Christ Jesus. We don't have to be concerned about other things other than just getting up here and preaching what Christ has said, what Christ has done, what God has done in Christ Jesus. We can just preach some things. We really don't have to be too concerned about our preaching style and all kind of other things that seem to bog us down. We can just get up here and just preach it. We can leave a lot of other stuff out, brethren, and just fill up that empty spot. We can fill that, all that extra entry space with the, what God has said. And, and what's in store for those who don't listen? If we just hold on to the end, we've got to preach these things because the situation demands it. There's too many people. Well, it's just, just too many of our brethren who are falling into sin, and they're continuing in sin, and the world continues to overcome them. And it's because, brethren, they're, they're not hearing about this eternal life. They haven't taken hold of eternal life. They're not living by faith. They haven't set their affections on things above. That's, that's the only reason for it. And we can just, we hold these things up before them. They need to hear, fight the good fight of faith over and over. If there was ever a time, I'm telling you, if there was ever a time these things need to be made, and you know these, we, it, now is the time in this present day. 
This high time, really, it, you know, we can say today it's high time, which really means that the time is already late when you say that. We're, we're approaching, a, I, I thought, you know, well, it's, well it, it's, this is the final hour. It's like at the close of business time on the last day. And we need to be preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to just preach what God has declared through his son. Paul said the word of truth is the gospel of your salvation. It's the gospel of my salvation, our salvation. Those who think they've already been saved, well, they've stopped preaching this gospel. And it's no longer gospel of salvation for them. They started talking about other things, most everybody. But we got some news for those folks, don't we, brethren? Nobody can claim they've been saved until they hear this word. What is that word? Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter, into, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now, we're not saying, we're not saying that uh, we can't mean, that we can't know that we're being saved. <laughs> we can know we're being saved, we're, that we're in a condition of salvation. Matter of fact, the truth is God wants us to know. He wants us to have the fullest confidence in our salvation that who began a good work in you shall fulfill it and finish it to the end. The Lord said, this is the Father's will that all of which he hath given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. Brother, we can know we got salvation. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. These are the kind of things we're talking about or we're preaching about, speaking about. All, of them are, are they, all these things are alive and, and expressed in the preaching of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Now, I'll tell you something. The reason we got a world in a mess like it is and the reason we got such a divided religious institutions out there is because this gospel has not been preached. It has not been made known. When men had an opportunity to preach it, they didn't. They just they preach something else. That's just the facts. Whether they knew what they were doing or not, whether they intended to or not, it's really beside the point. The point is they, they preach something different. This, this, they preached a message that was tainted by the world. And so so many years we've had a religion that has no power. There's no spirit of God working in it. The evidence of our day is clear. You look around. We're seeing, and you're witnessing in this day, uh, the judgment of God on this thing. On a religion that's professed to be of God all these years, it isn't. And it's just saying it's falling apart right in our witnessing. It's falling apart all the pieces. And you know it's going to continue to fall, brethren. If Revelation 18 tells all about it. Now, you know, now that God has... To me, he's missed, we've missed, it looked like until God changed the situation, we pray that God will. He will provide an opportunity. But just, it looks like sometimes, you know, that uh, it's like men who, who know the truth and want to preach it. They love, they got a love for the truth. They have a, a, that much love and desire to preach it. They ain't got nowhere to preach now. Nobody wants to hear them. I know men like this personally who are, can, very, can very well effectively preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they ain't got anywhere to preach. Nobody wants to hear it. They know the truth. They know how to declare it. Nobody wants to hear it, it seems. We pray. We pray. It's our prayer that God, the time will come, quickly come, when God will change these circumstances. Now, here's a bitter time. Here's a bitter time in Jeremiah's day. Uh, Jeremiah 8:20. The immediate application is doing is during the siege of Jerusalem. He speaks of the anxiety of the people. It is anxiety of the people because a, a, a considerable amount of time has passed. The city continues to be under siege. No one has come. No nation has come to their aid to save them. There's nobody. It seems nobody to help. And if and uh and the, and the verse reads this way: The harvest is past. The summer is ended, and we are not saved. Jeremiah says the city will be taken. It will be utterly destroyed. And Jeremiah knows. He knows why this is going to happen. And his, the, the evidence is a, a few verses later, he laments the situation. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughters of my people. 
This verse may bring to your uh, remembrance of our Lord's same tears. As he approached the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, he looked over it down at the city. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou hast killed the prophets and stoned them, which are sent unto thee. How often I would gather thee like uh, children together, even as a hen gathered her children under her wings, and you would not. Later on, he tells why. Now, the record we've been given, brothers, records such as these has been written for our learning. Actually, the word, the, the written word, the record we have is a pronouncement of God. It's a declaration of the facts. It's not what God, it's, a plan, it's not what God intends to do so much as, as, as though he wants to do it. It's, in fact, it's what God's going to do. It's what is going to take place. It, they're, they're telling us ahead of time what God intends to do. And God wants to have this testimony. Paul writes it down. And men are saved by it, and we are brought into the knowledge of the truth through it. Now, this passage, we have our scripture here and this text. You know, Paul, he's doing to the uh, brethren in Ephesians just as he exhorted Timothy to do when he told him, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same. Commit thou to faithful men who shall, be able to, who shall be able to teach others. Men who are able to teach others, commit these things to them. Now the saints of God, the, God is entrusting this word to the brethren. The saints of God have been entrusted with the things that Paul are opening up right here. He's laying it out and setting the truth before them, before us. The saints are being committed to this word. Faithful men who are able to teach others. Paul is giving what he had received to the brethren. This is the ministry, to give what we've, been, what we've been given. Paul lived it out. This is what he did. Remember what he told the elders in, the, in Ephesus, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. He told uh, the brethren in Corinth, for that which I have received of the Lord, I also deliver unto you. It's clear Paul saw himself as a steward of what he was given in Christ Jesus. His love for the truth was evident. And we are, too, we are, too, stewards in this manner. We have been called out by the word of truth. And we've become custodians, just like Paul became a custodian of the truth. We have become custodians as well. This is, a one, of, this is one of the many things that happen when the word of truth is heard and after it's been believed. We become partakers and car caretakers and stewards of this truth. Paul said, the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar of and ground of the truth. Now, we belong to the truth now, brethren. Just as much as we belong to Christ Jesus, we belong to this truth. We have fellowship in the Spirit, who is called the Spirit of truth. Ministers of the grace of God. This involves, of course, the ministry of the truth. Ministering in the truth. The word of truth. And the gospel of our salvation. Now, I mentioned briefly 2 Timothy 2.15 early, early on. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Handling the word of God rightly, accurately. Now, this possibility exists for all the brethren. All the saints of God. Everyone in the body of Christ can rightly divide the word of truth. This is not like I, I used to think. This is not reserved just for the preacher. This is not reserved just for the clergy. Not unless you understand that all God's people are clergy. Everyone who has the Spirit of God to some degree can say, this is that. Can make these, can make these assessments. Everyone who belongs to God needs to be able to do, to do this. This is that. Judgments. You know, also, Paul is uh, he's quick to, to point out that these kind of determinations and judgment, they do not come without studying. Study to show thyself a workman that need not be ashamed. Those who study, Paul calls them workmen. Before Jesus ascended back to glory, while he was yet with his disciples, while he was still with the disciples, there was occasions when he had to tell them, are you also yet without understanding? Are you still without understanding? He would tell them from time to time, ye know not what you ask. 
ye know not what ye ye know not what manner of spirit ye are. He would tell them. He also, in some of his most uh, closing words, he would say, "What I thou what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter." These these deficiencies and the, the lack of understanding the disciples had. This ironically, this is why the, the Son of God was with them. You know, while he, he still tarried with them. But, you know, it's all this confusion and, and all this uh, kind of thing went away uh, after, after the indwelling of the Holy Spirit came to them. After the Pentecost, this was no longer the situation with them. Everything kind of fell into place, you know. He, he didn't talk to them that way no more. After the Comforter had come, See, they, all these things fell into place. And this is a situation. We can read it right there in Acts. This is a common situation for all the brethren. All these things begin to, to fall into place for them. Of all the people in the world, the people of God should not be the ones not to know these things. Not knowing what God has said about his purpose for the body of Christ produces a lack of confidence and salvation. It causes men to follow other men. The apostle John tells the people of God, and you know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now, brother, we've already stated that when you come to Jesus because you belong to him, well, then you belong to this truth, this wonderful truth. For he is the truth, you see. And the saints of God, we have been delivered by this word of truth. It is the gospel of our salvation. And it has been committed unto our care, the care of the body of Christ. It is God's word, the, the truth, and it's been given to us. Paul called it my gospel. Why, he had, he, had, he had taken possession of it. It was given to him, and he took possession of it, and for good reason, too. I mean, it's good, it's good for us that God gave us the truth to the church. Because for the, you know, for the body of Christ, it, it is the, the support and the base for the truth. The church of God, we, we hold it up. We hold it forth. We belong to God. The truth belongs to him. And you know this can be a confirmation for us. It can be a confirmation for the saints. Now, men can err from the truth. They can depart from it. Uh, the record's very clear concerning men who have departed from the truth. It can happen. The scriptures say they departed. We don't, we don't debate about it. We don't want to hear that kind of thing about us or about any of our brethren. It's a, it's a grievous thing to hear something like, Thou hast left thy first love. So we're diligent to keep our, to keep our uh, love robust, our love for Christ, our love for the truth, our love for righteousness, uh, we, to keep it robust and alive, keeping these things fresh, fresh in our in our in our in our in our being. We want to walk in the truth, abide in Christ, rejoice in the truth. If so be that you heard and have been taught by him as the truth is in Christ Jesus. As we've already said, this truth, this word of truth, is a complete message. We've heard this throughout the our gathering. It's a complete message. It concerns Christ Jesus the gospel of our salvation. There's a whole body of truth, you see, that's available to the saints once we come into the kingdom. We would come into Christ Jesus through the preaching and the, the hearing and the believing of the truth, the word of God. We have access to it. Jesus Christ, the person, the person, he comes by way of faith in the message, the knowledge of God, the entire spiritual realm, these things, many of them are first fruits to us. That comes by comes by way of believing in the record of God's Son. You, you can ask if you, if you need wisdom, if you need discernment between good and evil, 
and, and these kind of judgments and things. And you can, you can come to Christ because all the wisdom of God is hid in him. It's, not, it's, it's impossible for anyone to overemphasize the importance of whom the truth of God is found and centered in. It's just too deep. Jesus told his disciples, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and ye are all brethren. In Ephesians it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. These are gifts that the Lord gave to his body. And those who have received them, well, Jesus said, they are all our brethren. And Jesus is our Lord and Master. If we desire to be under the protection and care of God, we must submit ourselves under the headship of Christ Jesus. I want to remind the brethren, once again, who they are, in Christ Jesus, and I'm through. And I want to do this by revisiting, staying in this passage, I want to re do this by revisiting the determinate counsel of God's will, who hath saved us, called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began. It's marvelous to consider God's counsel, Amen. the counsel of his own will, that's his counsel, what he, what he wanted to do and how he wanted to do it. That was, his, that was his counsel at the time, at the time of this same counsel, the counsel of his own will I'm talking about, when God's eternal purpose in Christ Jesus was set forth, the people of God were also chosen and set forth at this same time. Before the beginning began, when God chose Christ, it was then all those who would be included in the obtaining of his inheritance, why, we were foreordained in him. He has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world. From the beginning, before the foundations of the earth, Christ was appointed. And also those who would be included were also appointed. Paul says, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. But we are bound to give thanks always to you, God, uh, for you. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. The, teacher, the, uh, the scriptures teach. According to the one who does everything that he wills to do, the scriptures teach then that God has always had a people, hasn't he? Acor according to the scriptures. This remnant consists of those who have first heard from God and having believed. They first trusted, put their hope in what God said. They were recipients of God's grace. They were men of faith. Believe God. I'm thinking about men like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and others. It's really easy to follow. It's, just, it's written right here. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth, that we should be kind of first fruits of his creatures, first fruits that the Word of God is designed to produce first fruits. And it has an intended purpose here on earth, his first fruits. His first fruits. Though we'll have a glorious harvest, brethren, first fruits. The idea is that God, that the world would see this harvest, first fruits, and they would respond. The idea, they would respond in a glorious praise to him. It's, it's God's purpose is worked out and those who have trusted in him, and those who have trusted in and believed his word. Right here in our text, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Unto the praise of his glory, that we should be to the praise of his glory. Now, one final word. Now that Christ has come, and he has brought this greater light, and when the prophet of God comes and says, Get your things together. You shall not live but die. Brother, we won't cry about this anymore. You will rejoice that you're going home. Thank you.